morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another episode of ACNS Webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our special guest, who is a young scholar from Prague, Czech Republic, Dr. Adela Bubanikova. Dr. Adela is a member of the research group led by Professor Vladimir Benes and Professor Antresh Parach, currently affiliated at the neurosurgical departments in Military University Hospital and Mortal University Hospital, both located in the capital city of Czech Republic, Prague. Her work is mainly focused on cerebrovascular topics, neuro-oncology, hydrocephalus, and functional neurosurgery. We are extremely honored to have her today at our webinar, and today she'll be talking about an overview of cerebral cavernous malformations, comparison of treatment approaches. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Shen Xiaole. Professor Xiaole is a vice director, Department of Neurosurgery at the First Medical Center of Chinese PLA General Hospital, Beijing, China. His area of interest is in image guided surgery, and he has published several articles in various peer reviewed journals. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar, and today he'll be talking about a wearable mixed reality neuro navigation system, technical feasibility, and clinical implementation. The chair for the first session of today is our honored guest from Italy, Professor Marco Fontanella. Professor Fontanella is a full professor and chief of neurosurgery at the Neurosurgery Clinic, University of Brescia, Italy. He was the past president of the Italian Society of Neurosurgeons and current assistant treasurer of the WFNS and was the chief of web and publication committee of the WFNS. He is a noted researcher with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals. He is an invited faculty to various workshops and conferences organized worldwide. He is also known for his novel classification of cavernomas. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Dr. Adela. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest who is also the vice president of the ACNS. Professor Shubin. Professor Shubin is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Hua Shan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai, China. He is a global cerebrovascular expert who is credited with the largest number of bypasses for Moyama disease. He is noted faculty to various workshops and conferences around the world. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Xiaole. On the behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today, and with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Marco Fontanella. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Is a uh... A pleasure to speak uh, about cavernomas uh, today. You know that cavernomas uh, are a, a not topic because uh, vascular diseases uh, uh, are a, a special um, kind of vascular diseases. So can they can be familiar? They can be sporadic, and so it's quite difficult to decide uh, what to operate and how to operate. Uh, this uh, kind of lesions. And uh, I think uh, we have to share some uh, experience and some ideas uh, in what, what kind uh, of lesions uh, we are able to, to drive the patient to a better condition or uh, when not to operate that for us, uh, that we are surgeon is often very, very difficult. So I'm, I'm very glad to listen uh, um, the this topic from um, uh, Adela Bubekinova. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, we can uh, share a, a lot of experience and a lot of ideas, and I hope uh, a lot of questions for the audience. So thank you for inviting me. And I'm ready for the question, and I'm ready for this discussion. Please, Adela. Uh, thank you, first of all, all of you for a nice introduction and for inviting me to the session. Um, I would like to, I will try to share my screen at the moment. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so today uh, I picked the topic of, of talking about cavernomas. And uh, since this is a broad topic overall, um, I would like to let's say, divide this presentation uh, between two main uh, cornerstones. And the one will be our general knowledge about cavernomas, uh, about general knowledge of the disease itself, uh, how it forms, how it behaves. And I would like to introduce our systematic review and meta-analysis, meta -analysis, which we did uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, the second part of my presentation, because um, there are more uh, unknowns than knowns about cavernomas. 
will be dedicated to uncommon findings, to, to what we actually don't know about them and uh, what we should study more in detail um, prospectively and in the future. So um, what we do know, this is the first uh, part of my presentation, and I will start with the classification. Um, the most famous classification was, uh, by, was published by McCormick in uh, 1966, where he classified vascular malformations uh, into uh, five, five groups, um, uh, including viruses, arteriovenous malformations, venous malformations, um, cavernous malformations and uh, telangiectasias. And um, this moved further um, and the uh, most known classification for most neurosurgeons and for scholars around the world is the classification for uh, from the International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies, uh, where they say that the cacavernomas are classified as slow flow venous malformations. And this is because there is a really close relationship between carinoma and the venous system. And uh, I will talk about it later on, but um, the, the, now, nowadays they are classified as slow flow uh, vascular malformations, clavinous malformations. Um, it's quite a rare disease. Uh, the incidence in general population is below 1%, according to two studies by De Kerling and Akers. And um, but they are quite well known in neurosurgical society, and they are quite well known thanks to the invention of MRI. They were not previously detected by CT. It's quite too hard to detect by CT. So they are uh, they are about they are comprising the group of about fifteen percent of all CNS vascular malformations. Uh, sorry. Um, the pathogenesis and the morphology of the of cavernomas are um, really important to bear in mind and to be really familiar with. Uh, thank you, Professor Fontanella, for mentioning the, the sporadic and familiar forms, which are quite discussed nowadays. Um, cavernomas are morphologically resembling mumbly like cluster, which you can see in the picture on the right. I stole it. It's not mine. Um, but... Um, there's no intervening brain parenchyma, even no muscular or elastic tissue, uh, which differentiates cavernomas from AVMs or arteriovenous malformations. And the relationship or the difference between these two groups is actually really important to bear in mind to, to actually have the comparison between these two groups because cavernomas um, are slow flow besides uh, arteriovenous malformation as fast flow. There is a quite different uh, resulting from the morphological um, appearance of the of the malformation themselves. So even this should be uh, considered when we are talking about the bleeding from these malformations, because the bleeding from cavernomas are in vast majority of cases not fatal. Um, on the other hand, AVMs, when they rupture, it can be a disaster. Um, thanks to our innovations in research in terms of the pathogenesis and pathophysiology of these malformations. There are two forms. Uh, one is sporadic form and one is a familiar form of cavernoma. Um, and even historically, it was said that they are quite similar and they share similar pathophysiological mechanisms that leads to their genesis. Now it's known that it's quite divergent and there is a quite huge difference how they formate and how they behave and so on. Um, since familiar form is based on the mutation uh, within one of three genes, which are described so far, um, this mutation basically leads to unstable protein, which is uh, importantly involved in the angiogenesis. And this is why we talk, when we talk about familial form, we talk that uh, we talk about a phenomenon that there is a primary disturbance in the endothelial and vessels. So the, the cause of cavernoma is based on chronic disease. This is, this is primarily um, caused by the mutation itself. On the other hand, we actually don't know how, um, how sporadic cavernomas form. We know about some mechanisms, but uh, they do not share this genetic profile as familiar forms. And we think that we, they, 
basically form based on primarily disturbed renal system or primarily disturbed vasculature. And this is the clear difference which should be bear in mind. They even sporadic cavernomas mainly present or they, they can be found uh, draining veins or atypical draining veins around the cavernoma. And these findings are not really typical for familiar forms. Uh, this moves us to the natural history of the disease itself. Uh, we know about some phenomena which are associated with a cavernoma behavior, but there is a lot of unknowns which need, need to be solved and it needs to be uh, answered. Um, there is a clear difference uh, between, or it was described that there is a difference in annual bleeding rate uh, between supra and infratentral locations uh, in terms of uh, located cavernomas in the brain. And there were also described risk factors of the bleeding itself. And we are mainly talking about the history of previous bleeding um, because patients who already bled are exposed to a higher risk of bleeding than those who didn't experience uh, bleeding beforehand. Uh, another risk factors are female gender or younger age or higher blood pressure and so on. But there is actually, there was a controversy about these possible risk factors. This is why they are described as possible and not fini, this risk factors of bleeding. And uh, this is also why there is a great variability of factors that are actually involved in the cavernoma natural course. We actually don't understand it that well. And um, we are hypothesizing most of the time whether we're actually finding the right solution because it's so hard, in, especially in sporadic cases. Um, to, I would like to now in this slide introduce some historical treatment considerations because this is one of the most important slides in our presentation because it led us to actually conduct of the study um, where historically it was said that surgery is usually superior to treatment modality, especially if we are talking about symptomatic patients or patients who already bled as I introduced that is a risk factor hemorrhage also patients who actually have cavernoma, who has a pilot projection, or when we move from the hemorrhage to seizures, we are talking about uncontrollable, uncontrollable uh, seizures and uncontrollable epilepsy patients, which uh, tend, to be, tend to be indicated for surgery. On the other hand, radio surgery itself was really controversial. There was a lack of comparison between studies, and uh, there was really we didn't know was the effect of radio surgery for cavernomas so this is why it was really um it was not indicated that much most of neurosurgeons even didn't consider this option beforehand and uh, this is why uh, we wanted to in our study we wanted to compare all of these treatment modalities together uh, to have clear comparison um among the treatment efficacy and when we are talking about the treatment efficacy, uh, we wanted to compare how the treatment, uh, individual treatment modalities are effective in prevention of bleeding. Um, so to speak, what is the risk when the patient goes or undergo, undergo surgery? And what is the risk of the bleeding afterwards or radio surgery or when the patient is observed all the time? We also wanted to evaluate the risk factors of bleeding itself. We were searching for demographic factors, but also factors of, um, let's say, cavernoma characteristic uh, themselves. The methodology is so boring, so I don't want to uh, get into a lot of detail, but uh, it's necessary to understand what we did. Um, we searched through five databases and additional sources, which is um, the, the whole journey of uh, the literature identification was um, introduced in PRISMA guideline. It was uh, involved in the PRISMA guidelines. And we wanted to be really sure that we include almost like in all cases, high quality data. So uh, we conduct uh, we conducted the bias assessment. We used the Newcastle Ottawa scale for this. We modified the scale a bit in order to actually get um, only high quality or middle quality study to actually reduce uh, reduced the, the potential risk of bias. And then we performed the statistical analysis. 
uh, the statistical analysis uh, was comprised by, or we, we divided the statistical analysis into two groups. And uh, we also performed the heterogeneity assessment to actually, to actually see how these data were heterogeneous or homogeneous. And in the end, we performed sensitivity analysis. We did a lot of work on this as well. Um, the results are quite interesting because we are able to identify almost 9,000 patients who were treated between a 30-year period. So this is the most robust model so far uh, published. And uh, we were able to, um, let's say, uh, extract uh, almost uh, 41,000 um, person years of follow-up in these patients. So we had actually the ability to compare between the treatment modalities and to actually observe bleeding after the treatment or within the, the observation time. This is the first result of an analysis. Uh, I talked about the treatment efficacy. So um, on, the, on the left side of the table, you can see the treatment efficacy. And the treatment efficacy, as I said, is the prevention of bleeding. So we can see that surgery is the most effective in terms of prevention of bleeding. It can deliver the prevention of bleeding in 97% of cases. Uh, however, uh, what, and what I need to point out in this slide is the efficacy at radio surgery is 98, uh, 90, sorry, 96% of cases, which is quite a high number. And we were uh, actually really curious about how it's implemented in further, further statistics. And uh, before I move to this, I want to point out that you can see the mobility and mortality in radio surgery is uh, 9% and 11% uh, in, um, in surgical series. Uh, as I introduced in the pathogenesis slide before, uh, we were talking historically about the difference between supratential and infratential locations. But what, what we observed was that the difference is actually not supratential and infratential, but it's about the lower and brainstem or cerebral and deep seated locations. So, to speak, it's better to talk about deep seated and brainstem locations and cerebral and lower. And cerebral cavernomas must behave more like hemispherical lesions and deep-seated behave more like brainstem lesions. And what we observed was actually that there is a quite huge difference, statistically significant, between the annual bleeding rate between brainstem cavernomas or deep-seated cavernomas when compared to lower cavernomas with p-value um, at, this, at this value. And what is interesting that when we considered the annual bleeding rate after radio surgery or after surgery, um, it was reduced it was reduced, which we obviously expected, but um, the lower cavernomas are really the same, or there are not really huge differences because the annual bleeding rate of cavernoma itself is really small. Um, this is why it looks like this. Um, what, what, I, what I wanted to point out at the slide of the treatment efficacy, the radio surgery uh, reached the value of um 86 percent this is a really interesting finding and we wanted to know why and whether the radio surgery actually has effect of, on prevention of bleeding itself and to our surprise it has the benefit and i i know that you most of the neurosurgeons we will will want to kill me after this but it has the benefit when compared to the natural course and we wanted to point it out in the graphical interpretations as well so here on the right, you can see the graph of probability of bleeding. And uh, the blue lines are indicating the natural course, the green are already the, are indicating radio surgery, and red lines are indicating surgical series. The upper line is the upper confidence interval, and the lower line is the lower confidence interval. So actually the effect size is in between. But the thing is that the radio surgery actually performed really well in these series and it has the the it has a lower mobility mortality rate when compared to natural course so it has some benefit in terms of pre prevention of bleeding and because we wanted to actually compare locations we 
uh, extracted the data on annual bleeding rates and the probability of bleeding for brainstem carinomas, which you can see here, there is a quite, quite, uh, quite clear difference um, when compared to the graph before, which was for overall carinomas. And you can see that there is a quite high probability of bleeding in 40 year perspective uh, within the natural course. So it's reasonable to actually consider tra active treatment policy in brainstem carinomas. But what is, what is surprising is the graph, which you can see right now, because this graph is dedicated for low, uh, to lobo carinomas. And we can see that there's a quite overlap of the treatment modalities and of the probability of bleeding. And um, as you can see, as, well, as, well, as, well, as, well, as I wanted to point it out, um, the difference between the annual breeding rates are so small that the, the, the effect of the treatment modalities are overlapping and the, the, the probability of bleeding is really, um, really similar to each other. And this is the comparison uh, between the brainstem or lobo carinomas. And you can see, and what I want to, to, to you to recognize uh, is that the I scale, you can see the top is 80% of probability. But here you can see the probability is 20%. Uh, so we are talking about the probability of bleeding for lobo carinomas, which is in 40 years somewhere here. So there's a quite real difference between the, the probability of bleeding um, when compared brainstem carinomas to lobo carinomas together. Um, the next step of our meta-analysis was to actually find the risk and protective factors of bleeding. And uh, we did it by using the models of Parson distributions, uh, which is something really, really comprehensive. And I don't want to talk about it uh, in more detail. But the thing is that we wanted to observe the occurrences of bleedings in time. And what we found out is that the brainstem and deep seated locations, uh, um, these two locations are actually associated by higher risk of bleeding, as well as the female gender or previous bleeding uh, before, before, the, before the treatment actually started. And the protective factors are on the other hand, lower location, cerebral location, male gender, and the absence of the bleeding before the treatment. So this is our meta-analysis we did. And now we will move to the second part of my presentation, which will be actually even more important than the previous one. Um, I would like to illustrate the dynamics and the, the, the unknowns, uh, what we don't know um, about carinomas in one illustrative case, which was um, our 20-year-old lady with a history of severe concussion and deep, uh, deep venous thrombosis after an injury. And she was admitted to our neurosurgical department and presenting with uh, fifth nerve palsy, right vanished corneal effects, and diminished bite force of the right face. And uh, the CT looked like this. So there are a few hemorrhagic lesions um, uh, on, uh, on the right side, and we didn't actually know what it is. So we performed MRI, and this is what appeared afterwards. Um, she had multiple carinomas all restricted to the right side of her hemisphere. And uh, she had one symptomatic carinoma in the mechel cave, uh, which uh, showed a mass effect on the pons and which we decided to surgically resect it because she performed really well before the surgery. And she uh, wanted to, she accepted the, the offer to the, the surgical treatment. And she performed really well after surgery as well. Uh, we administered uh, anticoagulant, anticoagulant therapy, and after five days, uh, she was completely all right and was discharged home. But uh, two days after discharge, so let's say seven days after the surgery itself, she came back to the ambulance with this finding um, in her right hemisphere. All these cavernomas ruptured. And uh, she, she, she had some symptoms of intracranial hypertension. And uh, we wanted to see why. So we performed uh, DCA. And we saw that she had uh, occlusion of superior sagittal sinus, as well as blood occlusion of transverse sinuses. And um, this was really surprising finding for us. So, uh, but we 
but we uh, did a thrombectomy attempt after 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 we did the the DCA, but it was unsuccessful because of various reasons. She she didn't want to cooperate. She had a really uh, really severe headache during the during the thrombectomy. So we administered anticoagulant therapy, and twelve days after uh, the MRI proved the recognition of both uh, both synthesis. And the previous therapy was switched to the one year use of uh, Ap apixaban. Um, however, uh, this is the, the this is the comparison which I would like to show you. This is the this is the twelve days following the thrombosis after recognition, and just to give you the comparison between um, before the thrombo or after the thrombosis and uh, after recognition of mentioned sinuses. Um, this is the DCA and uh, MR angiography again. Um, and we wanted to actually see why the patient had, uh, whether that there was any genetic predisposition for this, for this phenomenon or uh, whether she had a uh, familial or sporadic form. And unfortunately, we didn't identify any of the CM, uh, CCM genes. So she had sporadic form of the disease. To our surprise, and um, the reason why actually, uh, she, no, the the reason it was not the reason, but that she had a predisposition of venous thrombosis thanks to the hypophenemolytic polymorphism for the pi gene, and um, she also had, which was previously known, the mutation uh, methylatetahyl folase reductase mutation, but um, thanks to the pi gene from thanks to the mutation for the pi gene, she had. Uh, twice as high uh, risk of venous thrombosis when compared to a normal person. Um, and this is basically the last uh, MRI uh, control we did uh, several months ago. And basically six years following the surgery, she didn't have any uh, new cavernomas or new hemorrhagic events, and she performs really well. But the finding is very unusual, and we cannot actually say um, why it is restricted to only one hemisphere. We can say why these cavernomas ruptured. We can say we can say that uh, there was just high higher uh, pressure, high blood pressure within the venous system. This is why it led to the rupture of multiple cavernomas. But it wasn't described in the literature so far, uh, as as far as I can tell, to the best of my knowledge and to the to the literature search we did. But um, these phenomena are not that common and uh, they are quite rare but they should be bear in mind when considering the the dynamics of cavernoma uh behavior and we still we are just lacking our information or we are lacking the knowledge to actually explain why this happened and why these cavernomas are restricted to only one hemisphere and we wanted to or we just the, the future direction of our research would be actually see how the relationship between the venous system and the formation and progression of cavernomas is really um, really elucidated or not. And uh, this is the next case, which uh, I would like to just so show you the dynamics of, uh, of the cavernomas and to show that there is quite heterogeneous um, behavior and that the heterogeneous mechanism of how cavernomas behave, but we actually don't we actually can't tell why and these are the questions which needs to be answered this is the case of of lower cover number which you can see right here um and during the then during nine years of follow-up it basically didn't change it didn't grow it didn't it didn't much bleed and the patient performed the the whole time the same but in other cases such as this one um there was an identification uh, of cavernoma uh, in 2015 and during the follow-up and during the surgical resection of the cavernoma in 2015 uh, the patient developed this right after two years uh, two years after the surgical resection and it ended up like this and um, these patients were really similar in their uh, clinical examination and they were really similar in terms of the age and so on but their cavernomas different behave completely differently i mean actually don't 
don't know why and this is uh, why it needs to be uh, why it should be maybe elucidated more in detail in the future and um, to say that there is a direction towards our towards better improve or improving of our understanding of governor dynamics and um, this is why I wanted to maybe open a discussion uh, after I finish my presentation whether uh, you know about any factors that are involved because based on the literature we actually don't know um, there are animal models are dedicated only to familiar models or they are only to familiar cover nomas. so we don't we know, we know really little about um, the sporadic cover nomas themselves and there is a there is some association between primary distributed venous system and cover nomas just as the DVAs and cover nomas there are a lot of case reports reporting that after the thrombosis of DVA, the novel cover noma appeared. But we don't know what mechanism are or what mechanisms are behind these behavior and these and these basically appearance of cover nomas and the behavior of them themselves. And um, that there are there are multiple cover on the on the right side you, you can you can see this was our most famous cases in our department so far and it is about the approach it is about the decision uh how to treat it whether to treat it and so on but they are quite heterogeneous group uh cover themselves so um there are a lot of unknowns which need to be studied more um in the future and just to conclude somehow my presentation uh, based on the meta-analysis and the data we already have we know that surgery is really highly effective in the prevention of hemorrhage um, but radio surgery is a method of choice and based on our results we uh, know that it has some benefit in terms of prevention of bleeding and uh, this is why radio surgery maybe should be um, indicated for cover nomas who, uh, which are surgically too risky based on their location uh, or in patients who simply uh, do not want to undergo surgery and um, but still have a cover noma that should be actively treated. And uh, valency policy or observation itself uh, should be indicated in selected patients, which is like a long-term consensus um, uh, for these patients uh, for a long time. And these are mainly asymptomatic uh, lesions or lesions that are too risky uh, in terms of surgical resection or radiosurgery. And... Um, we also observed some risk factors of hemorrhage, which we already know, but we wanted to specify what locations are actually associated with higher bleeding rates. And that is the deep-seated deep and brainstem locations, not only infratentrial, but deep-seated and brainstem. And we proved or, or what are also other authors already said, uh, already observed, that patients who actually had uh, his uh, had intracranial hemorrhage before the treatment. They uh, are exposed to higher risk of really bleeding, um, and also one of the risk factors is the female gender. Uh, what is the another thing for discussion uh, after after I finish my presentation is a question of the role of surgery in hemispheric lesions, especially when we wanted to when we calculated the annual bleeding rates. And when we actually calculate the graphs, we know that there is a quite overlap of treatment modalities. Um, and there are actually high benefits of the natural course in lobal lesions. I'm not considering uh, epileptic patients. I'm considering it only from the perspective of prevention of hemorrhage. But um, there is a high benefit of the natural course in hemispheric lesions with really small uh, a risk of annual bleeding rate or very, very, very low annual bleeding rate. And so um, there is a questionable role of surgery in, in these lesions, especially when we consider surgical uh, complications and sur surgically surgery related mobility and mortality, um, because we know that the, the actual risk of hemorrhage is not that big. 
and it doesn't very change after surgery itself. Um, and the last thing, which is really important uh, for scholars around the world and for us as researchers and for us as neurosurgeons, is that a lot of unknowns required for the research and there are a lot of things that we simply don't understand and uh, the direction of further research, especially this, to, to actually elucidate the dynamics of the disease, to actually say whether it's possible to predict how um, cavernoma will behave and uh, how the treatment consideration should be applied. Um, this is this is uh, the the study we published. This is the meta analysis. Um, uh, of the data I showed you before. Um, it was published in the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry in, in March, I think. And uh, there is a book uh, which I would recommend. Uh, it's a quite of advertisement <laughs> in this slide, but I would, uh, we wrote this book, or our group wrote this book uh, in 2020. And the whole problematics of cavernomas uh, are described there. Uh, from the from the very beginning of the history of cavernomas to the very end um, through the genetics and all of this stuff. Um, this is one of um, most inspiring people for me. Um, this is the Richard Feynman who said one, uh, one, once in a university in, Amer in the US that the first principle that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. Um, and this is applicable for cavernomas as well, as at least from my perspective, in terms that um, we are limited by our understanding. Or the one thing that one thing is that we are limited by under understanding, but the other thing is that we are limited also by our inability to accept that we don't understand something. And I don't understand many things about cavernomas, but I will really love to. Uh, research it uh, in more detail uh, prospectively and uh, it would be great to have an international cooperation on this and um, the last slide of my presentation uh, is a picture uh, of my hometown Prague um, I hope that you all have been there already and if not I would highly recommend it for you and on the right, there are uh, photos of my mentors and of my teachers and my friends who uh, motivate me every day and who inspire me in my work. And without them, it would be completely impossible to uh, have the presentation today with you. And um, it would be impossible for me to research uh, uh, what I love the most. And many things uh, go to them and many things go to you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, um, my really compliments for the, for the presentations. There are a lot of questions, I think. Uh, first of all, we, we don't really need the, what is uh, uh, bleeding for cavernoma. What we mean with bleeding, because uh, uh, bleeding uh, um, uh, we should uh, think uh, uh, to uh, some blood in uh, the CT or uh, NMR with uh, a neurological deficit. Sometimes uh, we perform follow-up to these patients and we see some kind of uh, em, you know, emo ring or something like that. And the neurologist says, uh, oh, it bled but that really was bleeding the the the, the patient that doesn't add any neurological deficit so it's quite difficult to say this uh, was uh, a bleeding cavernomas and this wasn't so this this is the first thing and um connected with this uh, i would be very um, uh, i'm not very sure what is the bleeding why a brainstem cavernoma should bleed more than a, a, a cerebral cavernoma why perhaps just because it's the brainstem and we see the neurological deficit more than in a right frontal deep cavernoma that if i have a, a 0.5 cc of blood i 
I, I don't mind. I, the, the patient doesn't, doesn't really have any any neurological deficits, so it's quite difficult what we mean with bleeding, I think. The second thing that we have to consider that uh, cavernoma is not an AVM or aneurysm or another vascular muscle deformation. Cavernoma uh, is, uh, mm, can increase in size and is a, is a problem especially if it is in the spinal cord or in the brain stem or in other sites, it can increase in size. And of course, this is a problem because you show us a very nice, a very nice cases where the cavernoma was increasing years after years. And this is another problem that is uh, typical of cavernoma. We 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 don't deal with with a problem like this in an aneurysm or in vascular in other vascular malformation. And uh, uh, and uh, there are uh, other thing uh, uh, about cavernoma. If uh, perhaps uh, the familiar cavernomas. Uh, as a, a, a different, uh, uh, are more prone to bleed than the, the uh, sporadic cavernoma. And uh, for example, for the CCM1 is more prone to bleed than CCM2. We, we, we still don't know, completely don't know this. So I think it's uh, very nice to study all this. Uh, uh, I'm uh, happy what you said about the um, radio surgery because we have to know more about radio surgery. Of course, uh, there are uh, serious of selected serious cases uh, because uh, perhaps that case is uh, we haven't uh, a randomized or a prospective uh, trial uh, about uh, the radio surgery, so it's quite difficult to to think what uh, is better to 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 do with these uh, these patients. So thank you very much. We have to 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 study more and more, and I think uh, your meta analysis is very very nice. And uh, really, my congratulations. Thank you very much for your comments. I really appreciate it, and I will really consider it. I think that you're completely right in terms of the bleeding. I I uh, completely agree with this. Thank you very much. We can invite comments from the house. Yes, my co-host Libun Chen. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rajya. Thanks, Professor, for a very nice presentation. I have a three question for you, Professor. Uh, you relate uh, the the form the carbonoma growth uh, related to venous flow. Uh, in that uh, context, uh, would you think that uh, by giving anti platelet or anticoagulant such as aspirin or Clexen, uh, prophylactically we reduce uh, the risk of bleeding and the growth of the uh, carbonoma. Uh, my second question, Professor, uh, what do you think regarding the VEGF inhibitor used as prophylaxis, as, as some studies have shown that uh, it may be related to the growth of the carbonoma? My last question, Professor, uh, regarding surgery for carbonoma and hemosiderin ring, uh, do you think that your surgical technique will change uh, if the patient has seizure or without seizure? Thank you, Professor. Um, thank you very much for for your questions. I will need to I will, I will ask you sorry if, uh, to repeat the first uh, the first one. Yeah, uh, re related to venous flow, you have mentioned that uh, the carbonoma may be related to the venous flow. So, would you think that giving prophylaxis of uh, aspirin uh, as anti platelet or, or anticoagulant such as Clexen, we have to reduce the risk of bleeding uh, rather than not offering the patient anything? For my first question, Professor. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, in terms of this uh, anticoagulant therapy, it's quite controversial, and the literature data are completely lacking, or at least from what I know, uh, and based on our experience, uh, we don't have much experience with this, and this is why we are really, um, let's say, um, aware of this, and we try to... Um, be really careful and we don't have any like standardized protocol for these patients if i understand uh, if i if i answer the, the question um the the second question was uh based on the i think the the the, the case uh with uh, unilateral cavernomas am i right with the with the anticoagulant therapy as well now are uh, uh, related to vegf inhibitor use 
Uh, will you think oh, yeah. that any role in the future, VGF inhibitor? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I didn't, didn't remember. I really remember. Um, uh, the role of, we, we actually didn't know about this mutation before we operated on the patient. So if we knew, we would behave differently, I think. Um, and uh, it's known that the inhibitor basically inhibits th these two exams, which are really involved in the cleavage of plasminogen to, pl to plasmin. And therefore, there is like a two... I think that five times higher risk of overall uh, venous venous thrombosis within the organ systems, and two times higher a higher uh, risk of thrombosis uh, overall. So this is why it somehow involved. It was involved in the in the rupture of cavernomas themselves and the, in the occlusion of the of the venous sinuses. So if we knew about this mutation before we. Def definitely uh, behave differently towards active treatment policy in this patient. And uh, and the last question was about the, the cavernomas and the hemocellular ring. Um, we, we, do, we, we do operate on them very meticulously and there is no, uh, we, we, we always study the MRI really carefully before uh, we go, before we actually offer the surgery for the patient. Um, but I wouldn't say that um, like the hemosphere ring actually um, makes differentiation between our decision making in these patients. I would rather say that it's it's based on location, it's based on the and the growth we talked about later on about the dynamics if we have any comparison. But if it's safe and if we know that there is a quite high risk of bleeding after, uh, if we don't operate then there is a high risk of bleeding, then we operate on this patient when it's safe. And when we know that the, the, the risk of surgery are smaller um, and they're acceptable and they are uh, still still like acceptable in terms of uh, in terms of the surgical complication themselves. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. I can say one one last word. Yes, of course. Uh, we still don't know. There is the um, literature is very poor about the recurrence of cavernoma. I mean, uh, we know that uh, uh, about the appearance of the novel cavernoma, but uh, of course, if I uh, if I um, uh, surgically treat a patient, I have to say to the patient if uh, this disease. Uh, can recur or not. And uh, usually we uh, say to the patient that the cavernoma cannot recur in the same uh, site where we uh, take it off. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not so sure <laughs> because uh, uh, we, we see now some series and we wrote a series of uh, recurrence of cavernoma and uh, Michael Lawton uh, um, uh, wrote uh, on your surgery on journal on your surgery a series of brainstem recurrence of cavernoma, and uh, we we are all surgeons and uh, uh, of course we, we have uh, uh, we have never in our series uh, a remnant of uh, a cavernoma, but uh, sometimes we have actually we have, and so we should be very clear that. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, we leave uh, some very small part of the cavernoma and we have to follow up that patient. Perhaps it's better to go again on the site, on the surgical site, to take off uh, the, the, the small parts. But uh, we, we still don't know if you leave a small part of cavernoma, what uh, will happen uh, and in the future. So I think a um, very nice topic to, to study in the future. Thank you. Sorry. Thank, Thank you, you Adela. Yes, Thank you. Green. Yeah. So uh, you you mentioned that the radio surgery is a good uh, treatment for uh, brainstem uh, carbonoma. Actually, uh, we also treated uh, with uh, radio surgery, but the radio surgery has both uh, advantages and uh, dis disadvantages, and uh, it uh, it's dose dependent. Low dose radiotherapy can induce endothelial cell proliferation and reduce the pro uh, 
possibility of the bleeding, but uh, high dose radio surgery, radio therapy can cause uh, cavernous malformation to enlarge and uh, induce uh, cystic uh, degeneration or edema. So uh, what kind of, uh, you, you, you didn't mention the dose recommendation in, <laughs> in your presentation. What's, what's your opinion? Thank you very much for, for mm -hmm. your question. This is actually really important, as you said, that the, the radiation dose and the, the enlargement of the carbonoma itself. And to be honest, like from our experience, we don't have much experience on treating brainstem carbonomas by radio surgery. So it needs to be, I, I to be totally honest, I don't have the data to actually say what dose should be sufficient or so should be adequate. I completely agree that this is the eloquent location and we really need to be meticulously, co let, let's say, deciding between surgery and radio surgery, especially when the radio surgery can cause radiation induced damages and so on around the coronoma. And um, I think that the, because there was a controversy about whether radio surgery is actually effective, I don't have the data to actually state how much dose should be indicated or not. Yes, normally we use uh, one third of the dosage, dosage for treat the tumor for the mm -hmm. carbonoma. Yeah, no, normally uh, from 14 to 16 gray. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, we have your mentor, Professor Vladimir Benes here. Professor Benes, please come and give your esteemed comments. Oh, uh, it was a nice lecture. I believe that the most important message is that the radio surgery plays a role in the treatment of carbonoma. Since uh, recently we were all the time repeating that there is no place for radio surgery, but it definitely is. Uh, no regarding the dose, no regarding the, the location, there is a place for radio surgery. Definitely we should prefer uh, surgery above radio surgery, but there is a lot of space for uh, observation. Uh, the difference between the, uh, you saw the curves, the benefit for the patient comes only 20, 25 years after the treatment in a hemispheral cavernomas. So I don't think that it's reasonable to offer surgery to a person who is 60, 65 years old. I do not see a point and we cannot provide him the benefit unless there is some symptomatology, unless there are epileptic seizures. There was a question on epileptic seizures. Uh, that's something uh, I do not know whether resect only cavernoma or the surroundings. Usually what we do, if it's an eloquent area, we resect cavernoma only. If it's non-eloquent, we resect more according to the um, monitoring. Uh, I believe that uh, I cannot praise the lecture. That, that, that was good. And I, I believe that there was uh, lots of information and uh, there are still lo lots to come from all of us. I believe that the cavernoma side by, by far not the solved issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Benes, for joining us today. If I'd like to ask Professor, uh, Dr. Adela about, uh, have you considered size as a in prognostication for bleeding and prognosis in all this meta-analysis? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, we actually, uh, this is like the most common question I receive uh, when I when I talk about the meta-analysis itself. And we wanted to consider it, but thanks to the lack of data during the studies or within the studies, we didn't consider it in the final analysis. But there are others which actually consider it and which calculated that the size uh, makes sense and that there is the difference uh, whether smaller smaller cavernomas or larger cavernomas associated with its uh, risk of bleeding. But ourselves, we didn't do it because we have really little data to actually in, in, involve them in the analysis itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. We had a wonderful session with Professor Benes, Professor Fontanella, and Dr. Adela. We can move on to the second session. Before that, any comments on people who have joined us, Professor Shubin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Xiao Lei Chen. And uh, tonight we all already have around 1,000 audience in the WeChat channel. 
that's a great number thank you very much yeah. we'll move on to the second session yeah professor uh, chen xiaolei is very good at uh, uh, endoscope uh, surgery and uh, he also invented some uh, special instruments it's a lot already adopted by uh, around 200 hospitals let's welcome professor chen xiaolei uh, dear chairman dear Professor Xu, dear faculty, today it is truly my honor to be here and share with you uh, with our experiences for the uh, for the development of uh, of a variable um, mixed reality uh, mixed reality navigation system, and uh, we will describe the technical feasibility the. Um, uh, the development of the system and the clinical implement of the system. I'm Dr. Chen from uh, Beijing, China, uh, from the Chinese PRA General Hospital. Uh, so uh, in recent years, the uh, words VR, AR are more and more popular uh, in the daily life. Uh, everybody is everybody uh, is very familiar with the uh, word VR, which means uh, virtual reality. And uh, um, uh, another interesting word is AR, which is called uh, the augmented reality. Uh, the most maybe the most popular uh, one of the popular uh, AR apps on the mobile phone is uh, Pokemon Go, and so uh, in in routine neurosurgical practice, we use AR uh, to project the image of the patient. For example, in this case, the ventricle and the uh, catheter insertion trajectory onto the patient's head or the skull uh, so that we can uh, make the localization of the lesion and uh, for the uh, preoperative planning. And, uh, uh, der derived from the AR, there's a new, another a new field which is called mixed reality, aka MR. Uh, so it means that we use some uh, put some hologram, holographic image, the hologram uh, in onto the real world uh, three dimensionally. For in this case, for example, this is a patient suffering from a, a trigeminal trigeminal neurotia. We can three-dimensionally reconstruct the trigeminal nerve, the basilar uh, artery system, and uh, the, including the offending uh, vessel, and to make it into a hologram and put it floating in front of us. And uh, so that we can observe the offending vessel with the uh, uh, REZ zone of the uh, trigeminal nerve. So in this case, we use a mixed reality system or a mixed reality generated uh, hologram to, to help us to do the preoperative planning. And uh, uh, this was done several years ago or more, more, than, more, than, more than six or seven years ago. So after that, after the holographic mixed reality simulation of the uh, uh, of our neurosurgical planning. And we are thinking that if we can, is it possible for us to develop one system to use uh, mixed reality to uh, take the place or partially take the place of our routine standard neural navigation? Why? Because we have issues with the standard navigation now. First, the standard neural navigation, in, in this case, it's a, it's a curve station by Brain Lab. It's, it has a bulky hardware. Although the design of the curve is very, very attractive and wonderful, but the, still it's a, it's a bulky machine and a system, including IR camera or field generator in the case of the uh, mag electromagnetic navigation system. And it, it includes a big workstation and the uh, accessories like the, uh, the uh, frame, registration frame, the uh, camera, et cetera. So it's first, it's bulky. Second, because a lot of hardware included in this system, a standard na neural navigation is usually, it's very expensive. 
for example, in, in China, uh, one standard new navigation usually will cost more than uh, more than 300,000 US dollars, which is uh, quite a big investment for the hospital, especially for some um, rural part of uh, China or undeveloped part of China. So uh, another problem is when the neurosurgeon is use, use uh, new navigation system, usually when we use a navigation pointer to, uh, to, um, to do the localization of the lesions, we are distracted from the surgical field because we are watching at the screen of the navigation system and instead of the, the, the real head of the patient. So uh, if we use microscopic based neural navigation, we can, uh, we can overcome this issue because we can just look at the surgical field the, and the microscope will inject or project the image of the lesion and the, the surrounding eloquent structures onto the surgical field. But it, it also needs the, needs the, um, uh, it needs the uh, uh, extra investment. So that's a, that's a big problem for us to, 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 for the standard neural navigation. So we, we are thinking that if we can develop some um, low cost or, uh, am I having some, uh, dear chairman, do I have some network problem now? No, everything is good. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, so we we are thinking that if is it is it possible for us to develop some some low cost mixed reality neural navigation system with a head mounted device so that we are not distracted from the surgical field when we are doing the navigation and uh, we performed the the um, the uh, test in the past several years so this is a head mounted device that we uh, we are using. This is uh, uh, HoloLens by Microsoft. The hardware is by Microsoft, but we, but we developed the software the, for the navigation use um, by ourselves, by our team. So with this device, we can wear this device and do the surgery. So this is our, we call it the prototype one, the, pro, the first generation of our uh, system. That is uh, the, the hologram generated from CT or MR image should be manipulated by the neurosurgeon with a finger gesture. So we can, we can move the, the, the hologram until it, it confines with uh, markers, with the real markers. The red dots are the virtual markers that generated from MRI in this case. So, we use this for the early stage endoscopic procedure. For example, this is an endoscopic assisted VP shunt. We can uh, generate the a hologram of the ventricles, including as well as the trajectory of the insertion of the catheter for the uh, VP shunt. This is a prototype one, but it's still very cumbersome because the finger gesture is not precise enough. And so we cannot uh, perform in an uh, oblique way, we can only use finger gesture to, to mix a hologram in a standard standard uh, pro, uh, uh, supine uh, position or the lateral position or the prone position. So if the patient is in, in, the, in an oblique way, so the, the navigation will not work. So we are on this basis, we, uh, we start to further develop our system. So this is a prototype two, the second generation of the mixed reality navigation system. In this case, we use a, a Xbox joystick to control or to manipulate the hologram. Um, in, this, in this case, we can uh, more precisely uh, manipulate the, the hologram and we can rotate the hologram in all the three axes. So you see, you can use a joystick to do the 
zoom in, zoom out, uh, manipulation, and to, to rotate the hologram in X, Y, Z, three uh, axes, all the three axes. So in this way, we have more precise manipulation with uh, with uh, hologram. So in this case, this is a big uh, lesion meningioma located as, uh, around the, uh, the sagittal sinus and the uh, transverse sinus. So we, we can just rotate and uh, manipulate the hologram until the virtual markers confined perfectly with the uh, real markers. And in this way, the meningioma was just uh, directly projected onto the patient's head. So in this way, when you are we wearing our uh, mixed reality device, looking at the head of the patient, the meningioma was just there. So in this way, it will be easier and more straightforward for us to, to make the um, to design the incision, to design the, the bone flap, and to do the tumor localization. So this is a project, to, a, a, a prototype too. But in this way, it's still not automatic, right? It's manually. So we still need, need to manually manipulate or manually control the hologram until it confines with the uh, markers. It's still not very satisfactory. So uh, this uh, is, was done by, uh, in 2018 or 17, several years ago. So next, we try to develop a, a real, a real product, a real automatic or semi-automatic registration uh, mixed reality navigation system. In this case, you just need to use this positioning tool. It, it, it is just a piece of a plastic. It contains no electronic parts. So it is very, ext extremely cheap. You can even three-dimensional printing, 3D printing it uh, and to use it. So you just need to adhere uh, five, at least the five markers on the patient's head and use the, the positioning, positioning tool to, uh, to do the registration one by one until the, all the five markers are registered. So after that, the tumor and the surrounding eloquent structures will automatically being projected onto the patient's head in a holographic way. It is very, uh, very easy to use. So let's uh, look at, let's see a short clip to, to see the whole workflow. This is a big meningioma located in the frontal lobe. And we first use uh, open source software to three-dimensionally reconstruct the, uh, the meningioma, as well as the uh, sagittal sinus, as well as uh, markers, uh, and uh, input it or export to the holographic uh, head-mounted device, in this case, a HoloLens. Then we use the ho uh, positioning tool to do the registration one by one until five markers are registered. So you see, it is very easy to use within five minutes. You can finish the registration of the navigation system. So, and uh, in this case, we do not need any uh, IR camera, the navigation camera or electro, electromagnetic gener uh, field generator. It's, it is a completely untethered navigation system. So, Registration of the, all the five markers, the, the tumors, the tumor was just directly projected onto the patient's head as well as uh, central sinus. Then we calculated the, the error, the distance error between the, the lesion contour generated from a set standard neural navigation system and with our holographic head mounted a variable na navigation system. And we, we record this uh, distance error. So from April 2018 to February 2021, uh, totally seven, uh, uh, 37 patients was uh, uh, enrolled in our study. They all have intracranial lesions 
and uh, who needs to be operated. As all cases have cranial anatomy for lesion removal, the median area for mixed reality navigation system is 4.1 millimeter compared to 2.5 millimeter of the standard neural navigation. So we cannot say this mixed reality neural navigation system is precise enough for a DBS electrode implantation, but the 4.1 millimeter distance error is enough for some superficial lesion localization or for some easy, for some simple procedure like the hematoma localization and uh, evacuation or the uh, catheter insertion for the hydrocephalus or EVD. So this is still, uh, we think is uh, precise enough for some simple procedure. So for intracranial, intracerebral hematoma uh, localization, you, you see with this holographic system, the hologram of the hematoma was directly projected onto the surgical field. So wearing this um, wearable mixed reality navigation system, you can just uh, stare uh, at the surgical field, at the patient's head and uh, see the uh, lesion directly. So for even for some bedside uh, procedure like the hematoma catheter insertion and catheter insertion and the drainage for some intracerebral hematoma, you can still use this system. And uh, we are developing the prototype three stage B, the, the, the next generation, which is a markerless system. You, you see this patient, the, we, we do not have any markers on the patient's head. This patient is suffering from a, suffered from a, a parasagittal meningioma. The, the green one is a meningioma and the yellow is a, a central sinus as well as a transverse sinus. So in this case, we do not need any markers, any physical markers stick, stick on the uh, patient's head. And uh, we still can can perform the mixed reality and uh, uh, perform the registration and uh, as well as uh, followed uh, mixed reality nav neural navigation. So um, our, the features of our of our system is first it's a uh, completely uh, untethered and independent uh, untethered system and it is independent from standard neural navigation system. Uh, there's some uh, similar systems, but uh, they are just a kind of holographic display device with a uh, standard of a uh, standard neural navigation system. For example, uh, the Brain Lab would develop some 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 magic leap mixed reality device, but it is actually a, a holographic display system. It cannot work by itself without a standard neural navigation system. Uh, so th for this case, it's just um, for this kind of a tethered system, we call it tethered system to a standard neural navigation uh, system. This tethered system uh, do, will not, personally, I, I, I think it will not have very deep impact on the clinical routine use because it's still very uh, cumbersome and uh, very expensive. but our system, the navigation, all the things, all the calculation, we called the calculate power is still is completely within the device itself. So you can just with a head mounted device, holding a positioning tool and you can do the navigation. So it will have deep impact on the, some, on, on the uh, developing country like China. Uh, because it's cheap and uh, it's um, very easy to use, right? So the cost is very low. The system is less than ten, one tenth of the standard neural navigation system, including hardware and software we de developed. So we are now considering and uh, we are working on it. We are working on uh, further lower down the investment. We have some uh, light 
um, lightweight and uh, even low cost mixed reality device than the hologlass. So it, 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 the, the future will be bright. And the, the system is easy to use. It's fully operable with uh, neurosurgeons. We cannot imagine that if every procedure, you will have a technician, you will have a mechanic, you will have a technician from the navigation company to help the neurosurgeon to do the navigation. It's not possible. So in our system, from the early stage uh, open source software uh, procedure to the neural navigation uh, procedure, it all can be done by the neurosurgeons. So it, it is, um, I, we think it is more practical, pra practical than the, uh, than the other system. And uh, it may be helpful for lesion or hematoma localization, especially superficial big lesion or the uh, hematoma localization, because for this kind of um, uh, procedure, the precision uh, standard is not so high, right? So, and also it, it, it will be helpful for bedside procedures like EVD or the hematoma caster insertion and drainage, right? It also may be helpful for rural hospitals. For example, I'm now working in Xinjiang in the well, uh, northwest part of China, which is the most undeveloped part of China. And uh, this, this part of in this part of China, most of the hospitals, most of the rural hospitals cannot afford a very expensive standard navigation system, but you can easily afford a head mounted, uh, this kind of low cost mixed reality uh, system. Uh, and uh, actually, we are also doing the navigation with this system in Xinjiang. So, um, but, and another place is uh, maybe the battlefield procedure, procedures. For the battlefield, you cannot have very bulky uh, uh, navigation system, but this kind of a wearable or head-mounted device will be very helpful. So um, finally, we, our summaries are as follows. So first, this study provides a complete set of uh, clinical feasible workflow on a easy to use mixed reality navigation system using a variable head mounted device. And it, this system, pro, pro, uh, this study proves its technical feasibility and uh, accuracy. And uh, uh, further development is yet required to improve the accuracy and the effect, efficacy of this system. And uh, our study has already been published uh, last year in the uh, Neurosurgical Focus. If you are interested for the technical details, you can check our uh, paper. Um, this, uh, the final, I want to thank our, uh, the, the whole team. Well, our team has a name called Tactical Neurosurgical Team, aka TNT Team, and we are still recruiting uh, members. You can, you are welcome to contact us. Uh, uh, finally, thank you very much, and thank you for this for this opportunity by the ACNS. Uh, I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Chen. I thank think you. this is a very interesting question. Uh, whether the system can use the CT on or CTA data to achieve the navigation. Ah yes, uh, this uh, the, this system is open for the universal uh, medical images, including CT, CTA, uh, MR, and RMI, uh, and the special. Um, and we have the uh, first we we process uh, we will process the image and perform the three dimensional um, reconstruction with an open source software, which is called three D Slicer. And uh, this is a universal medical image processing platform. So every uh, image, as long as it is a DICOM image, data can be processed. Thank you. I think this is a very useful, uh, in especially in the emergency uh, treatment, like in the yes. battlefield. And yes, very useful. Yes, because completely agree. It's, it's especially for the younger surgeons. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shialoshan. It was wonderful uh, description of such a novel, Mixed Reality Device. I would like to ask whether it has it been externally validated in other centers other than you? Ah, yes. <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, it has already been validated in another uh, external uh, three centers. And uh, for our same team, uh, the, the other centers uh, the, has a similar uh, data or similar results. And uh, for our uh, own team, the TNT team, because we have an opportunity to try this system or validate this system in the in three uh, in, inside or three internal centers, uh, one in Beijing, and uh, one in our Hainan campus in Sanya in South China, and the one is in Xinjiang in the place where I am work now working now, so in Xinjiang. So um, all the three internal centers and the three external centers, all the teams has a similar results. It's so our system has already been validated. Now the problem, the issues is the workflow including the software processing, uh, three-dimensional uh, career construction, and the ex in exports to the uh, mixed reality device and the navigation. The workflow is still needs to be simplified. So now it is still a little bit complicated for, for neurosurgeons, uh, especially for neurosurgeons who are not familiar with the computer science. Uh, but we are working on it, and we are very confident that uh, the young neurosurgeons they can easily uh, handle handle this, uh, you know, uh, with a very short period of the training. Yes. We How are long does it take uh, when you get the like the CT or MI data, then created the uh, navigation system? How long? Ah. Uh, the, the pardon, you mean how, how long? Yes, when take, you, right? when, ah, when yes. the... Okay, uh, so usually the, the uh, pre-navigation, uh, three-dimensional reconstruction and planning uh, uh, needs about 15 minutes, 15, one, five, 15 minutes, and the navigation takes about 10 minutes. So within 30 minutes, uh, a trained uh, neurosurgeon will easily do the navigation. Thank you. That's great. That's indeed great. We have Professor Takashi Kon joining us from Tokyo. <laughs> yes, Professor Kon, any comments from you? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, th uh, thank you for this presentation. So um, Tokyo, Japan, uh, we used to have a similar virtual reality system, but uh, uh, preparations are very difficult and sometimes uh, with the real tumor sites and uh, uh, between uh, due to the cerebral fluid. So uh, the discussion in that case, uh, what are your uh, uh, how to uh, tackle uh, in your institute for such problems? Uh, pardon, uh, I, I, I can you repeat uh, how to how to how to uh, how to tackle with with how what, to treat, what's the issue? Uh, what's the, what's the issue? Uh, problem? Uh, what issue is about the uh, cerebral spinal fluid uh, dislocation? Okay, ah, the, the brain shift, right? Okay. The, the brain shift. So, brain uh, shift is right? Ah, yes, yes. Yeah. That, that's, a, yeah. that's a great question. The brain issue shift cannot be handled, cannot be overcome mm. with, uh, mm. uh, with a navigation system only. Mm. We need some kind of intraoperative imaging. Um, mm -hmm. measure to, to overcome the brain shift issue, like the intraoperative CT, intraoperative MR, or intraoperative ultrasound, right? So that's not a, that's not, not a, uh, that's not a field, or that's not an indication for the neural navigation system. Mm -hmm. So for, for in, uh, in our center, our experience is, uh, is to, uh, to use this mixed reality navigation system for some superficial lesion localization and uh, for some uh, big enough lesion localization. 
you cannot use this to localize the brainstem cavernoma. It's impossible because, because the brain shift will make the navigation no longer precise, right? But it, you can easily use it for a localization of a big meningioma, especially superficial meningioma. The system will guide us to, to get the, the position of the lesion. And then we will see the lesion boundary with the, with the normal brain tissue, right? Because they are completely different. So um, the, the, uh, the solution to counter, to use this mixed reality uh, new navigation system and uh, overcome the brain shifts, uh, the only thing I can say is, your, is to choose your enemy wisely. Choose your enemy wisely. You you will not choose the brainstem cavernoma for the for to use with this mixed reality uh, navigation system. So uh, otherwise, if you really want to overcome the brain shift, the only suggestion is to integrate some intraoperative imaging method, right? Uh, of of course, you can use the intraoperative MI to to do the intraoperative. Uh, imaging after the brain shift and then to update our mixed reality um, navigation plan. But, but it no, the precise, the precision um, will be, would not be acceptable. So I will not use this to overcome the brain shift problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Marco Fontanella, any comments from you? Yes, uh, I, I think it will be the future of this uh, because uh, especially for the low price uh, possibility to uh, to uh, use it uh, uh, bad side I I read the paper you you wrote I think on, on John your surgery about the ventricular drainage uh, position uh, yes yes and uh, yes. I think it would be very very yeah, and uh, uh, if you like to, to send a, a paper to Journal on Neurosurgical Sciences, you will be welcome. And uh, but uh, I think uh, it would be really very good. Of course, uh, there is the precision is, that is lower than the uh, other methods, other uh, navigation methods. Uh, but uh, I think for some pathologists uh, and for young neurosurgeon and for their uh, for not not big hospital can be very very useful. Adela, you you think the same? In in Czech Republic can be, can be useful. Definitely, I completely agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any comments from my co-host Libun saying? Well, just one thing is uh, is possible to find somewhere these devices uh, outside China. Or, uh, ah. or uh, you think there is not a market? Uh, is still, is still, uh, a, you know, a, a, a prototype, and is not uh, going to sell this uh, outside. Uh, that's a that's a great question, and uh, it it is easy to answer. First, the hardware, everybody can get it. Uh, it, it is a standard, commercially available hardware. It's a, it's a HoloLens generation one from the Microsoft's company. So we are still working on the de development of a hardware based on the HoloLens two and our only un undesigned holographic mixed reality device. But still, so far, as long as you can get a HoloLens one, you can, you can do the navigation. For the software, we developed the software and we have the IP, we have the uh, copyright for the software. But as long as you want to test it, we can send you the software and tell you how to install it, install it on the HoloLens one. Uh, we have already tried this in the, in, uh, just like I had just mentioned, we have already tried this in another three external uh, centers in China. So as long as you 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 want to have, have it give it a try you can just contact me we can send you the install installation uh, 
uh, file to, to install it. Uh, for the positioning tool, uh, you can have the STR file so that you can three-dimensionally printing it by yourself. So everything is easy and simple, right? And uh, cheap. So you can get it uh, anytime, uh, as long as you have a HoloLens one. But the pro problem is, uh, as I know, the HoloLens for generation one has already been uh, stopped uh, for uh, production. So you can get a second hand, maybe HoloLens. You can get the navigation system. Thank you. Just, just contact me, contact our team. And we can send Thank you the software. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, we can conclude and hear from, uh, before that, any questions Thank from you. Liu? Uh, I just want to ask Professor, uh, doing the, the fusion procedure, uh, since this is a head-mounted uh, uh, device, uh, after the registration, either with judicial point or the uh, anatomical, like, like uh, the nose or what, so will the head movement of the surgeon affect the fusion? One. Uh, second thing is, Professor, uh, I find that the magnification is quite gross. Would the, the uh, accuracy in magnification affect the real size of the lesion? Uh, my last question, would this image be able to fuse or uh, appear in the lens of microscope in the same? Ah. Uh, those are great questions. Uh, first, the, the problem, the one issue that, that I didn't mention so far with our system is that the patients first need to be rigidly uh, fixed with a three pin head clamp, right? The second is once, uh, once uh, registration is, uh, is finished, the patient's head cannot be moved. It cannot, cannot rotate or, or move to, to, another, to a, another position. Uh, once the patient's head is moved, the registration is no longer working. So the navigation will not be valid. That's a problem, but we're still working on it for some re-registration intraoperatively, um, but it's still not, uh, not finished. It's not infected. The, the second, what's the second question? Excuse me. On the magnification, would your gross magnification uh, change the actual ah. size of the region? Yes. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, it is a holographic image. It completely confined with the uh, real actual size of the lesion. There's no magnification uh, in this case. You cannot, it, it's impossible, right? The, 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 the third is, uh, ah, is it possible to integrate into a microscope? So far, it's not possible. <laughs> it's not so far. Um, and we are not uh, trying to do this because it's uh, not very practical because in, with uh, integrated to a microscope, it's called AR, augmented reality, microscope based navigation. And uh, uh, with this one, it's a mixed reality, new navigation. We just want to do this before we use the microscope or in any procedure that we do not need the microscope. So we, are, we will not inter try to integrate this into a microscope. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. We can hear the concluding remarks from Professor Shubin. Uh, uh, yeah. Dr. Hashad, uh, he asked the three questions. This system is good enough for posterior fossa or pioneer region lesions? He already oh, showed that mm -hmm. posterior fossa lesion and obviously. And, uh, is this system patented. device is patented or what is the cost? Uh, uh, the the uh, the system is good. You, you can use it for the posterior cranial fossa uh, lesion. But uh, I I believe, and we also test in several uh, in a small sample test. The uh, the registration or the navigation uh, error will be will be uh, bigger than the than the uh, super uh, tentorial. Um, lesion localization. So uh, you can use it, but uh, it's not uh, very precise in that case. For pioneer region uh, lesion, I strongly recommend you do not use it. Again, choose your enemy wisely, because for pioneer region, uh, it's a deep-seated lesion. 
And uh, when before we access the lesion, we need to discharge a big amount of the CSS, which will cause a severe uh, brain shift. So for deep seated lesion, for lesion uh, has a very high potential to cause a brain shift in, during the procedure. I strongly recommend you do not use this kind of um, easy low cost system. And the cost, the cost, like I said, I, I have said, this uh, cost is less than uh, thirty thousand U.S. dollars. It's um, it's uh, including the hardware and software uh, investments. So it's just less than one tenth of a standard neural navigation system. It's very cheap, uh, if we consider as a medical navigation device. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Shubin, can we wind this up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Today we had a great two lectures and I would like to close this officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kaito. I would like to thank both speakers of today, Dr. Adela Bonikova and Professor Shialo Shen and the Chairs, Professor Marco Fontanella and Professor Shubin for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. A special thanks to my co-host Lubun Singh for joining me today. Until we all meet on Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.